What's up guys, today we're gonna to be going over anterior cord syndrome. So this is one of the incomplete spinal cord injuries that we're gonna talk about this along with posterior cord, central cord, cotaquina, and brown saccard. So this is anterior cord syndrome. So let's kind of get into it. So as I was saying previously, this is a incomplete spinal cord injury. So super important to understand that there is some sensation below the level of the, the, the lesion. So it's important to note that with this one, that it is the anterior two thirds of the spinal cord. So if we look down here at this picture, we can see that this area from like all of this is going to be affected. So we can see that the dorsal columns are okay. Ooh, doral columns, so this thing is wrong. The dorsal columns are okay. So they remain unharmed and that's responsible. And this is important for sensory and proprioception as well as vibration. So proprioception and vibration are both good. So understand that the, that's because the dorsal columns are okay. Now the corticospinal tract, so the uh, ventral and the lateral corticospinal tract, those are both affected. I remember the corticospinal tract is the main motor pathway and the spinal thalamic tracts, which is over here. So spinal thalamic, ventral and lateral columns, those are both affected. So the um, lateral spinal thalamic tra tract, that is going to be pain and temperature and then light touch for ventral. So essentially the big things that are happening here uh, is the pain and temperature is going to be affected. So those are both not happening with this. So this can usually happen due to damage to the anterior spinal artery. So if we're talking about different anatomy that can be associated with it. That's kind of what's going on when it comes to anterior cord syndrome is that there's, there could be um, like a lack of blood flow to the spinal cord itself due to damage to the anterior spinal artery. And that can happen due to trauma, some sort of hi uh, hyperflexion injury, and also when it comes to like some atherosclerosis, so just anything that's causing a vascular insufficiency to the anterior spinal artery, this could end up causing um, anterior cord syndrome. So if we're talking about etiology, as I said before, this is the big thing. It's a flexion injury to the cervical spine. So we can see that this person is going to a hyperflexion injury, which is just going to end up. So as like, here's the normal spinal column, here's the anterior, here's the posterior part. If it's a flexion injury, what happens is it's going to be squished through this part. So the whole anterior part ends up getting squished, but the posterior is okay. So anterior is not okay. So again, as we talked about before, anterior two thirds of the spinal cord is messed up. So this can happen usually due to some sort of traumatic damage to the either anterior spinal artery. So that's the kind of thing I was talking about how the blood supply would get cut off and that would be a problem. So that could happen due to atherosclerosis or any sort of vascular insufficiencies down here. It could also happen just to straight up trauma. So this could be a fracture or dislocation, could also be some sort of disc protrusion or if a tumor is pushing on the anterior spinal um, artery or if it's pushing on the spinal cord itself, that could cause damage to the anterior two thirds of the spinal cord. So essentially something is happening to cause damage to the anterior two thirds of the spinal cord. And I definitely would make sure that you understand this would be a flexion injury because remember with a central cord syndrome, that would be a, a hyperextension injury. Um, so we kind of understand that that's what's going on with anterior cord. So what does it look like? So because here's our same picture here with the misspelled doral columns, dorsal columns, we see that the all motor function is going to be lost below the level of the lesion. So that's super important to note. So motor, eh, not working. Um, so then understanding that that's because we're affecting the corticospinal tracts as noted down here. I remember the corticospinal tracts are the main motor pathway. So motor not happening. We're also going to see because of the lateral and ventral spinal thalamic tracts, mainly the lateral one that we're going to see loss of pain and temperature. So pain, uh, temperature, uh, those both aren't happening. So, um, when it comes to this, of remembering which ones is, I like to think of the MTP joint, the metatarsal phalangeal joint. <laughs> I don't know why, but that's how I remember motor temperature and pain are all not working. So that's just how I remember it. I know there's some other acronyms out there, 
but um, that's what worked for me. So remembering that pain and temperature are going to be lost below the level of the lesion and that is going to be on both sides. So remember like Brown's of cards, that's the one where one half of the spinal cord gets all messed up. I'll go over that in another video, but for this one, it's both sides are messed up and that's due to, as we stated before, damage to the corticospinal and spinothalamic tracts. Remembering that the spinothalamic tract is the main sensory pathway that takes the information from the body and brings it all the way from the spine to the thalamus where it's going to be relayed and sensory integration. Now here's the thing though, proprioception and vibration are okay because those are uh, in the dorsal columns. So those end up being okay. So we got proprioception, that's okay. And then vibration, the vibes are good. So the vibes are good with the anterior cord. So I like to think VP, vice president, those end up being okay when it comes to anterior cord. So that is how I remember what's going on with uh, anterior cord syndrome is that the, the toe hurts and the vice president is okay. I don't know why. That's just how I remembered this one. The toe is okay. Uh, the toe is not working and the vice president is okay. So the vice president is okay, but he broke his toe. That's, that's how I remembered it. I don't know why. That's just how it went about. And remember with many spinal cord injuries, I would say pretty much all of them, there's gonna be some loss of bowel and bladder slash sexual dysfunction due to damage to the uh, sacral segments, which innervate both uh, bowel and bladder as well as your reproductive organs and uh, stuff like that. So understand that there's probably going to be a problem with that. Making sure this patient is also on a plan for working with bowel and bladder, whether it be like uh, timed avoiding or intermittent catheterization, something like that, urge suppression, working on this because there is this, they can still sense what's going on because they have proprioception and then they can still sense vibration. So those are the things that are okay because the, the vice president is okay. He just hurt his toe. That's kind of what's going on with that. And then uh, this is another thing for many spinal cord people. It's just watch for possible respiratory involvement because of it's affecting the C3, C4, C5 levels that remember it affects the motor tracts because it's corticospinal. So just be careful if it's a really, really high spinal cord injury that it could affect the phrenic nerve, which is C4, C4, C3, C4, C5. Keep the diaphragm alive for the phrenic nerve. Being careful about that because remember it's the diaphragm is a voluntary skeletal muscle. So we got to be careful to make sure that it's not being involved with this because that means the patient might need some more like respiratory therapy, some airway clearance techniques, or even events. So just being careful what's going on with this patient. So that's kind of what's going on. Big things, motor pain and temperature, uh, proprioception and vibration. We're okay. So how are we treating this? So we're going to make sure the patient is stabilized first, kind of how we talked about in, um, central cord syndrome. The main thing is making sure that this person's okay, because if they have a hyperflexion injury like this, this could be from diving into a pool. This could be from falling as a gymnastics, a motor vehicle accident, something like that. If it's a really bad thing. And like, especially if they're going to have respiratory involvement involvement, we need to make sure the patient is okay and that they're not going to be dying. So first of all, let all of the special medical personnel stabilize the patient, and then we will be involved. So they might be in this thing called a halo vest or halo brace. So that's over here. And there's actually these screws, all these little screws are screwed into the brain itself. Well, not the brain into the skull itself. So you can see that goes through, um, in, through the skin into like the first little layer of the bone here. And that's to just really stabilize this. So with this patient, actually, this is kind of a bad picture. This part right here in the back is, um, not really there with the patient. Uh, just so then they're able to lay down on their back and like lay and like lay in bed and stuff like that. So it's essentially, it looks like here's the head, he, here's, here's the nose on the front here. So the halo vest will come around like this. So then the back of the head is um, able to lay down, but understand that the patient's not going to be moving with this. So we got to make sure that they're mobilized, they're healing well, and we're just following what the doctor says. So once they're good to go, we're going to work on range of motion. So that could be with the upper extremities and the lower extremities, just kind of working on keeping everything moving because remember motor, eh, not there. The main thing, and this is the most important thing for any spinal cord injury is pressure relief and education on skin breakdown. So remember with our skin breakdown, if they're in a chair, every, um, they say like 10 minutes shift side to side. 
um, just because it's a lot more pressure on the sacral like area, such as like the ischial tuberosities when you're in a chair. And then if they're laying down in a bed, here's our person in bed, that is every two hours. We're going to make the patient shift around. We're gonna move the patient. And we wanna teach the patient and their caregiver how to move themselves around. So we wanna make sure that the patient is not going to have any pressure injuries because that is the last thing we want is on top of them wearing the super uncomfortable halo vest, can't move their legs anymore, can't do all the things they are, they're depressed, they're sad and everything. Getting an infection is just, you know, not the cherry on top that we want for this patient. So biggest thing is just making sure we're educating the patient and their caregivers on proper pressure relief and also making sure that they're aware of like how to do the bowel and bladder stuff to make sure that they're not like macerating on themselves and uh, are urinating on themselves and causing maceration. We just want to make sure this patient is okay. Understand that we're going to, this patient's probably going to be in a wheelchair and we're going to work on whatever functional mobility they need to. So we're going to work on transfers with this patient and we're going to work on um, wheelchair mobility, assistive device training. If they are able to use some, if they are having some motor function come back because with incomplete spinal cord injuries, we could get some function back, but we're just maximizing whatever they got right now. Um, mainly, and this is the big thing that I think a lot of us forget about as we're learning in school, anybody with a spinal cord injury, unless like they regain like full function, and everything, their way of mainly like ambulating in the community is going to be used through a wheelchair. So like, for example, it would be a lot of energy for this person to, you know, use a walker, go around the grocery store, pick up things, blah, 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 blah. blah. It makes so much more sense for them just to be in a wheelchair and, you know, roll around, get all the stuff that they need and check out and stuff. That's going to cause a lot less energy. And it's not going to feel like they ran a marathon after just going to like CVS to pick up like two things. So this patient's going to be in a wheelchair. We want to make sure that we teach them how to use the wheelchair appropriately, fit them for their wheelchair, all that stuff. We want to make sure it's all good. Compensatory strategies are always okay for spinal cord injuries because they're going to lose some function. So we got to make sure we're using that head hips relationship to help them with transfers and stuff like that. And also for like weight shifting and whatnot, and just helping them being able to maximize their level of function. And then we're going to work on strengthening to try to get some of that uh, strength back because remember motor is not happening with this patient. We are not having much motor things happen below the level of the lesion because those are the anterior columns. So Essentially, in a nutshell, pressure relief, education, keep them moving around, working on wheelchair mobility and compensatory strategies and strengthening. That's, that's pretty much what's going on with this person, maximizing their level of function and making sure that they're not getting any pressure injuries. Pressure, avoiding pressure injuries with anybody who's immobilized is like the biggest thing that the boards cares about. So keywords with this one specifically, flexion injury. And so this will help us differential diagnose between anterior co cord and central cord. Also with brown cords a little bit, um, understand that could be an injury or any sort of insufficiency to the anterior spinal artery. That could be a big one. Um, understand that motor is gone. So motor, uh, we got temperature, uh, pain. Uh, so remember pain temperature, not working. So our, our toe joint, our metatarsal phalangeal joint, um, and then understanding that vibration is okay and proprioception is okay. So our vice president is okay. He just hurt his toe. And then um, incomplete spinal cord injury. So understanding that it's not like everything's gone. Like they do still have some function and we can work on stuff. And then making sure that we're um, having a... Uh, um, the vascular insufficiency of the cervical spine kind of goes along with the anterior spinal artery. So kind of making sure that's okay. All right, guys, On to the sample question here. A physical therapist assistant is treating a patient with anterior cord syndrome. What will we still expect to function below the level of the lesion for this patient? One, motor function. Two, pain sensation. Three, proprioception. Or four, temperature sensation. So I'll give you guys a second to think about that. All right, guys, so proprioception is still going to work below the level of the lesion. So we got anterior cord, so we're thinking anterior columns. So we're automatically thinking right off the bat, motor, uh, temperature, uh, proprioception. Uh. 
And the way that I think of the difference between understanding because there's the two P's because the vibration is okay and, per, and uh, proprioception is okay, but pain and proprioception both start with a P. So how do I remember the difference between that? Well, I think vibration and proprioception kind of go along well together because you'll feel like the the vibration of something, then also kind of understand where your body is. And I like to think temperature and pain kind of go hand in hand because it could be really hot and that hurts. So that's kind of how I think temperature and pain are along the same lines. And also they're in the same motor track. So if we look at here, pain and temperature are both in the lateral spinal thalamic track over here down at the bottom. And so those are going to be two peas in a pod when it comes to us understanding that there's going to be some loss. So saying that vibration is okay, proprioception is okay, but we don't have motor, we don't have temperature, we don't have pain sensation. So temperature, no, pain, no, motor, no. So it's kind of like a, just a simple definition question. And it's good to understand um, what this, like with a lot of these conditions, it's good to understand what can they do and what can't they do. And that's what the boards will test you on because it wants to see how are you doing with understanding the pathology, what this patient is able to do based on their pathology and what they cannot do based on their pathology. So proprioception and vibration are still intact for an anterior cord syndrome, but motor temperature and pain are not. So I hope that this was helpful in explaining anterior cord syndrome, and I will see you guys in the next one. Take care.